Good morning folks, Keith McGowan, the Outdoor Dad here, here to help you have a better boating experience. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about what we're going to do here and more importantly why we're going to do it with this particular outboard motor. So please like, subscribe, send me any comments that you have. So soon my used outboard motor buying guide will be available to you. Um, all of my YouTube followers will get it at a discounted rate. Um, working on getting that completed very soon, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about the process here, why we do things the way we do things. I wrote some notes here because I want to make sure I got all the information to you folks that you're looking for. Um, the inspection process is key. You've heard me talk about this if you've watched any of my videos. We don't want to start buying parts too soon. We get excited, right? We got the engine block off the midsection. That's a very difficult thing to, to overcome sometimes. So, you know, we get excited. Oh, I need these gaskets now. I'm going to order those. This way I have them when I'm ready. If you're just a little patient and you finish doing your due diligence on these motors first. Um, you can find many project boats and motors out there that someone started and then they stopped and oh, I have all the new parts that you need. I have all this. What, why did they stop? Now, personally, I'm, I'm a big proponent of finishing what you start. Now, sometimes you shouldn't. That's why I haven't ordered any parts for this yet because I wanna do a full and complete evaluation first. So we're gonna talk about some of the things we're gonna do. Um, and when buying a motor, if you're, if you're buying a project motor, I always prefer buying a motor that already is running if it was already running and had a rod knock like this one did or had a bad cylinder like this one did which is probably where the rod knock came from but we're going to check the crank as well then you have a running motor instead of something that somebody already disassembled completely i'm always leery of buying something that someone else disassembled did they take care of the parts properly did they sit in a box and maybe moisture got in there and they and some things rusted so you want to be very careful with, with uh, motors like that or boats that have motors like that that are already halfway projects. There's a reason they stopped that project. Now, that's not to say that you can probably buy some of those at a very, very discounted rate because they're just looking to, listen, I didn't get what I wanted out of it. Come here, give me a hundred bucks or something like that and get this out of here, you know, because they're just looking to get rid of it. That's always a possibility. And then maybe there's some parts there that you need for a project you're working on that would cost you $150, $200, and you're picking up a whole bunch of other items with it that you can get, and you know you're getting something that you're just gonna keep for parts. So that's a different mindset. So before we dive deeper into this, we're gonna talk about it a little bit. What's the purpose here, right? The purpose is to have a good running motor. That's what we look for. That's what I always look for when I'm doing a rebuild, longevity. You can build these motors and you can make the ring gaps really tight and you can get another five horsepower out of them. And these, you can do some really cool stuff with these motors. And I'm not against that. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Me personally, I like to build reliable motors. So I go back to the specs in the book. I go back to what they look for. And even though they might tell you when you're boring and honing cylinders that you should be between five and a half and six thousandths, that's typical most motors. Some have some different ranges. Also depends on what type of pistons you're using, if you're using a forged piston or if you're using more of the manufacturer's style pistons. So we wanna take those things into consideration after we've done our full evaluation. So we're gonna tear this down. I had some great comments on this motor. Someone says that we gotta check those middle carbs. Someone also said sometimes these poppet valve rings break apart or they, um, get expanded inside here and choke down the flow so when it runs full out it doesn't simply open the way it should and the motors run too hot these are great comments and things to note uh, from from our uh, community out there of, of outboard people and the other comment they made was sometimes your water pump is old and it doesn't just have the pressure that it used to so if you remember we didn't get a lot of water flow out of this and this was our water pump. I'm sorry, no, this was the Optimax water pump. So here's an old water pump. And when I try to squeeze this, it's hard as a rock. So there's no flexibility in it to really build up the pressure that it needs. It may have flowed water sitting there idling at the dock. It may have flowed water when you're out on the water, you know, running it seems to be fine, 
but it doesn't have that pressure it needs to overcome that spring for that poppet valve to open up when you're running full out and now you're overheating your motor. Not enough to set the alarm off, but enough for it to run too hot. And what happens is when you're running it enough for it to run too hot, the pistons expand and we have different metals in here, right? So we have a steel sleeve, cast iron sleeve in here. We have aluminum pistons, it's an alloy, forged aluminum pistons. And then we have rings that are steel. So we also have ports in those cylinders, right? Something to think about on these two strokes. So as we expand a little too far, because we run a little too warm, that ring is gonna expand at a different rate than the piston. Top of the piston, the dome of the piston is what gets most of the heat. And that top ring is also what gets most of that heat. So what happens is that ring expands out a little bit further and over time, there's no chamfer left on those uh, ports that are in there because it's war wearing out as the, the cylinder gets older and older. And when it expands, it just catches the edge of that sharp edge on your port, and then that ring now pops out, and now you have spit a ring. So you can see it in some more drastic once you can see how these rings had kind of popped out of there this one had just run for too long after the fact also causing detonation so this uh, motor particular motor had water running through the engine but what happens is as you can see these little steel parts that are just embedded in the melted piston so what happens is you have a little piece of steel a little piece of this ring bouncing around inside here while you're out running and it glows red hot from the flames. And now as soon as that gas enters, that red hot piece ignites that fuel when it's going up. Now you have detonation. That detonation is, is detrimental to these uh, motors. So there's different ways detonation can happen. It can be a timing issue. It can be poor fuel, water in the fuel. Um, but most times when you spit a ring, that's what's gonna happen. So we're gonna get into some of the things a lot of these old timers taught me about rebuilding these engines when we tear this down. We talked about we're gonna check the carburetors. We're gonna check there's a, a gear, a plastic or fiber gear on the crankshaft that drives our oil pump. We're gonna make sure that that didn't get wiped out or if it's worn, we're gonna go ahead and replace it. So they've learned over the years that for these manufacturers, they make them out of little different materials and they last a little bit longer. So ProMarine is someone that I use for the pistons and for the parts for these motors. I have found them to be the closest to the original manufacturing, and that's what I like to use the most. So I've weighed them a little, you can buy that little scale, that little Harbor Freight scale. I know it's not that accurate, but it's accurate enough to weigh one against another, right? And then I can see how close we are to the manufacturer's specs. So that's why I like those. The other thing we look at is, you've heard me talk about the bottom of the cylinder. So we're gonna go ahead and bore hone this if it's a reusable block. We're gonna check it thoroughly to make sure it is reusable before we do that. And we're gonna make sure that the whole cylinder, top to bottom, is the same size. It's very easy on these, what they call a blind hole cylinder for these two strokes, because you can't drive your hone all the way through and back out again. So you can only go to the bottom and come out. So what happens? Over time, your stones, because there's stones on our honing, are gonna wear more at the bottom than the top. And the more and more you use it, the more V-shape you're gonna end up with. So I had an old timer at a machine shop taught me how to modify stones. So you'll see some of the stones that I have so that you can grind out the bottom of that cylinder first. I used to do it last. He said, no, you do that first and then you bring in the rest of it to match what's in the bottom and these are procedures that I was taught over the years. So the other key points to motors like this, these older two-stroke motors, is when we disassemble these we want to make sure we put all the parts back the way they came together. We want to record each gasket we need. Sometimes you can buy gasket sets and save a few dollars. Um, I'm still a big proponent of the manufacturer's parts but certain gaskets you know, if it's just a fiber gasket, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I even have some gasket paper where I've made some, you know, where I've broken a new one or something like that. Whether I've broken a new one or it's just one that wasn't in the kit for some reason, 
Um, or sometimes you just need it to make a gasket and there's nothing wrong with that with certain ones. Now head gaskets, that's a different story. Those I am very strict about sticking to the manufacturer's head gasket. There are aftermarket companies that people swear by. I haven't personally used them. So I've always used the manufacturers when it comes to head gaskets. This particular motor doesn't have head gaskets. It's got O-rings. So this is what they call an O-ring motor. Um, so it has an O-ring inside the cylinder and then it has an O-ring outside the cylinder head as well. So again, there are some aftermarket companies like Pro Marine who make really good O-rings for those and they work fine. Um, but if it comes to the fibrous head gasket with the metal rings on them, then I usually am pretty strict with sticking to the manufacturers. The other thing we need to look at when we take these apart is when we pull our connecting rods apart, you'll notice most of these where the connecting rod comes together, there's a needle bearing in there. I make sure I take that needle bearing out and the same way it went in, I don't wanna flip those bearings over and I put it back together, I wrap tape around it and make sure, and I label which cylinder, whether it's port side top, port side middle, port side bottom, and I label it on that tape and put it aside so I know exactly the cylinder and the position that it came out of. Yes, I will take them apart to clean them up, but I'll do them one by one, put them on my bench in the same order and the same fashion, uh, because I just like the way it was already worked. And if, if there's nothing wrong with the crankshaft and the bearings and there's no loose parts in there and it isn't, isn't worn out, then I want to put it back the same way that it came together. The other thing when you're pulling these connecting rods apart, you'll see that the sides were drilled. You'll see sometimes three holes where they've drilled through and they actually break these. So they're made in one piece and then they machine them to the proper size it needs to be and measure them. Then they'll drill holes in the sides right where the bolts go through and crack them. So when you put it back together, you'll see it's two cracked surfaces, almost like a broken piece of ceramic, a coffee cup handle or something like that that you glue back on. And it fits right back because of the, the rough surface, the way the brake was. So you have to be careful because what will happen is, is your cap will sometimes try and spread apart. Now they do make a tool. You'll look at the sides of the connecting rods, depending on what model and, and uh, manufacturer it is and they'll have some smooth ends as well as like an, um, for lack of a better term, octagon, but it's not eight sides, but it's three sides that are flat. And there's a tool you can slide on there, a clamp tool that you can tighten so that it, when you tighten your and, and torque your um, connecting rod bolts down, it makes sure that it's lined up properly. Um, I've never really purchased that tool. I have a big fat pair of pliers and I'll squeeze it and I'll feel it and I'll get it somewhat tight and then I'll take a pencil and I'll go over those smooth sections. Again, this is an old timer who taught me how to do this. You know, he goes, you know, you can buy the tool if you want. Even the tool doesn't line it up properly sometimes because they get worn as they get used or some of the tools, they're just not made and machined as well as they should be. So even if you use the tool, you're gonna to take that pencil and you're gonna rub it a pass where those two pieces meet. And if the pencil has shavings because it's catching, then you know that's not right. You gotta loosen it up and tighten them back up again. So those are kind of some of the things I've been taught as well as assembly lube. These motors, you know, two stroke motors, the assembly lube, you can use regular engine assembly lube if you want, it's your choice. But again, another uh, machine shop guy who's been doing this for years taught me to use white lithium grease. You know, if you've watched any of my videos, I like white lithium grease, but I mix that with Shell Rotella 15W40 diesel oil, engine oil. It's got a very, very high content of zinc and phosphorus, and that is what the metal parts need. The, metals will, the metal will absorb that zinc and phosphorus and give you a good lubrication. And especially on startup, the first couple times when we haven't even warmed up the engine yet, we want as much zinc and phosphorus in there as we can. And that, again, in, inhibits a good break-in for these engines. So I put it on the needle bearings, I put it on the cylinder walls. When we're machining our cylinders, we're actually cutting grooves in that that the oil stays in, right? So we cut the grooves in. We're gonna go through this process. I'm hoping this is a good engine for a rebuild. We're gonna find out. And we're gonna get into some more of those details and tips and tricks that I was taught over the years. So this is gonna be fun. I, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy 
having a motor that's a good running motor that I know someone's going to take out and run for many years to come. So I'm Keith McGowan, the Outboard Dad, here to help you have a better boating experience. Maybe you're not inclined to go this deep on your own, but at least if you're paying someone to do a rebuild, you know what you're getting and you can ask those questions. As a matter of fact, uh, my 75 Ford pickup truck, I took that to a machine shop. I didn't do it because I don't have the, the tools to deck it or to do the heads and the valves and everything. So I had someone do it. And I said, can I stop by while you guys are, are after you're done machining the cylinders and everything? He said, sure. Any of these machine shops that are really good people, they're, they're not, they don't have anything to hide. And he said, but uh, I don't want to hold up the process if I'm in the middle of the building and I call you, hey, I'm getting ready to put this back together tomorrow. I just finished the machining today. Great, I'll be there first thing in the morning. And I bring my dial board gauge with me and measure. And it was nice because it was spot on. Nice to see that. And he, he and it's funny because I'm doing the measure and he go and he's looking at me, you know, and he's going, "You satisfied?" And I'm like, "Absolutely," you know. And I paid the guy what he wanted. It's as simple as that. There's no negotiation when you have someone who knows what they're doing. They're worth the money. So, again, please like, subscribe. My used outboard motor buying guide is coming out soon. So keep your eyes open for that. And again, we're here to help you have a better boating experience. So please like, subscribe, and send me any comments you have. And we hope to see you out on the water, enjoying the time with your boat and your family. Have a great day.